Please remain standing. It is my privilege and St. Mary's honor and privilege also to have Bishop Shin with us today. I bet you thought I was preaching. I faked you out, didn't I? <laughs> it's Bishop Shin. Thank you for coming, Bishop. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here with you this morning. I'm delighted to celebrate this Eucharist on this last Sunday of the Epiphany. You know what that means. The Lent is just around the corner, believe it or not. Yes? Yes. You ready for it? Yes. Really? <laughs> Goodness, you're better than I am. What they say, wherever the bishop goes, he carries the entire diocese with him. And in this diocese, which is the largest diocese in terms of name, name, number of congregations, um, it is a pretty heavy diocese. There are 198 churches, and you're one of them. So I bring you greetings from 197 churches around the diocese. It's, it's probably about sixth or seventh time, actually, I've been down to Staten Island. I have to confess that I had never been to Staten Island before I, was, I became a suffragan bishop of New York. And this is now a familiar territory for me. So good to be back once again um, and to be among you. On the last Sunday of Epiphany, we always read the story of the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. So there are three-year cycles, so we hear Matthew's version, Mark's version, and Luke's version, which we just heard today. But there is also the Feast of the Transfiguration, in case you didn't know. The Western Church, because the God, is, God takes vacation in the summertime for Episcopalians, um, the Transfiguration falls right on August 6th. Um, so most, most Episcopalians kind of, you know, it goes over their head. But it's an interesting um, uh, image if you think about it. You know, we have the, in the winter months, in February or early March, we hear this Transfiguration story on the last Sunday of the Epiphany. And then in the summer month of August, we hear the Transfiguration story on this proper feast day. So you can, if you think of it sort of like an opposite pole, you know, the, the, the axis of, of the axis, and around it um, uh, goes the, the story of Jesus Christ. It is that important? Transfiguration is an important story a significant moment in the life of Jesus Christ. After six days of teaching, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up the mountain by themselves. We're not told the name of the mountain, just a high mountain, by, according to Matthew and Mark, and in Luke, just the mountain. The identity of the mountain has been the subject of speculation by many scholars. Most agree that, that this, might, this must have been Mount Horeb or Mount Tabor, where Moses received, his, received the, um, the, the, the covenant from God and the tabernacle of the Ten, uh, the Ten Commandments. But the name of the mountain obviously is not that important to the gospel writers. In fact, they often do not give specific names which we think of people and places which we think should be important. Like the anonymous leper, unnamed leper who was cleansed, or the anonymous woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears, or the unnamed prostitute who was saved from being stoned to death. It's not that they are not important. Rather, it is a literary device to allow the glory of Jesus to shine more clearly and immediately through these anonymous 
characters and places. It also makes Jesus and his stories more universal and accessible to us as we can imagine ourselves in these anonymous places or our, uh, replace ourselves in these anonymous characters to receive the same miraculous grace and forgiveness from Jesus. And then suddenly Jesus was transfigured before the three disciples. And all three Gospels say his clothes became dazzling white. And then Mark adds the emphasis, such as no, no one on earth could bleach them. So it was so white that it was, it was bleached beyond Clorox, if you will. Matthew adds that Jesus' face shone like the sun. So there was, a, there was a transformation in his clothing, in his appearance, in his face. It was just trans, transformed. Uh, his face changed, as Luke says. And then there appeared before them two other figures on either side, Moses and Elijah. Luke even as the subject of their conversation, the departure or the exodus Jesus was about to accomplish for himself in Jerusalem. See, this, is, this story is very significant because it falls sort of in the middle of his earthly ministry. He started his ministry soon after baptism. And where is he going? He's going to end up in Jerusalem. This is the turning point in his journey from here on. As he descends the mount, mountain, he is looking to Jerusalem. And it's an intentional journey toward Jerusalem, which Liu describes as Exodus. The Exodus Jesus was, a, was to accomplish in Jerusalem was no other than his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. And what his departure would accomplish was none other than our own salvation. The great exodus for all humanity from the bondage of sin and death. And in today's Old Testament reading from Exodus 24, Moses went up the mountain to receive the two stone tablets of the, covenant, of the commandments from God. The cloud covered the mount and the glory of the Lord settled on the mount, and the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on, on the top of the mountain. And Moses entered the cloud and went up the mountain. Later on, when Moses came back down the mountain with the stone tablets, his face shone like, um, like the light. So when Matthew asked the little detail that Jesus' face shone like the light, he was making a direct connection between Jesus and Moses. No doubt that Moses, the lawgiver of Israel, symbolized the law of God, the Torah. And Elijah, the first great prophet of, of Israel, symbolizes the prophecy of the Old Testament. So the trans transfiguration reveals the fulfillment of the law and the fulfillment of the prophecies in the person of Jesus Christ. The ancient law and the prophecies are transfigured by Jesus' dazzling glory. But there is also another cosmic symbolism operating here. As great as he was, Moses died just before the Israelites crossed the River Jordan into the Promised Land. You remember, Moses was not allowed, God told him, because when he, he came down from the first time, he came down from the mount with the, the, the tablet, the Ten, Command, Ten Commandments, Israelites committed a grave sin of worshiping the golden calf. He got so angry, he threw the tablets and it broke the tablets. And God said, God gave him a new tablet the second time, and, told, and said to Moses, you will not enter the promised land. And indeed he died just before crossing the river Jordan, looking at 
gazing at the promised land from the other side of the river. Elijah, on the other hand, when he crossed the river Jordan, was taken up into the heaven in a chariot of fire at the end of his earthly ministry. He did not die. He was assumed into heaven and became immortal. Elijah is one of two immortal characters in the Old Testament. The other is Enoch. Enoch, who was also assumed into heaven in Genesis 4. It's a little character that we overlook all the time. But if you read Genesis 4, we have all this list of, of people. You know, so-and-so lived, I don't know, 500 years and died. So-and-so lived 600 years and died. And so when it comes to Enoch, so Enoch, who was a good and righteous man, was assumed into heaven. Does not say he died. So the, it, so the tradition is that Enoch and Elijah were immortal, became immortal. And so it is believed that Elijah will return as the precursor to the coming of the Messiah at the last judgment, on the last judgment day. What we have here is the juxtaposition of mortality in Moses and the immortality in Elijah of the past and of the future represented by Moses and Elijah. At the center is, just, is Jesus Christ. He embodies both mortality and immortality, the union of the humanity, the human nature, and the divine nature. And it reveals the new paradigm of eternal life, the paradigm of death and resurrection. Jesus embodies both past and the future, the union of Alpha and the Omega. The reveals, he reveals the eternity of the present moment. And the disciples became terrified. And Peter, seeing the glorious vision before him, said to Jesus, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Both Mark and Luke add that Peter did not know what he was saying, as he often didn't. And right then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice was heard saying, This is my son, the beloved, with him I will well pleased. When was the last time we heard God's voice saying such a thing? Baptism. Remember the baptism of Jesus? The voice was heard from heaven saying, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. So baptism and trans transfiguration actually uh, serve as, the, the, they are the two most significant moments in the life of Jesus. There are two moments in which explicitly God says, he's my son. His identity as the son of God is revealed by God himself. And this is the central and most important detail. The last, so the, and, and all, but all good things, all good things must come to an end. And they must descend the mountain. And that's that true, isn't it? In life, now you experience some really something, some height of ecstasy, some great moment. But we have to face the reality the next day. You cannot continue live in, in such high anymore. And as, they, as the disciples were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered the three disciples to tell no one about the incident. Luke was perhaps a bit more realistic, simply said that they kept silent in those days. You can imagine what an experience, what an incredible experience it must have been for Peter, James, and John. This, this event must have been nothing short of a mystical experience for the three. Of course, they could not talk about it. How could they? Who would believe them? 
Moreover, they themselves probably didn't understand what they had just experienced. And it wasn't until after Jesus' resurrection and ascension that they realized the meaning of this divine revelation. And that's also how it is in our life, too. Now, you prob- some of you probably had some incredible experience, spiritual ecstasy or some, some, some big event that, that you try to explain it to your friends and, and, and no words can describe. All they can say, oh, that was great. That was great. But that's about it. There's, you, you cannot even describe and, and the meaning, the, the, the depth of all that experience. It, it, that's just how it is. That's how it is with these incredible mystical ex, experiences, spiritual experiences. And that's exactly what these three disciples had experienced. They kept silent because they could not say a word about it. They had no words to describe it. And the descent from the mount is important also in our own Christian life. Lest religion becomes just another form of escapism and addiction, the glory of God must be revealed from the height of the mountaintop. But the salvation of the world must be worked out in the low plains of the ordinary daily life the daily grind, if you will, in our daily relationships with one another. The dazzling glory of the transfiguration uncovers all, all our sins, all our pains, all our suffering. In today's reading from 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about glory of God reflecting like a mirror in front of us reflecting the truth of who we are. The human disfigurement from sin and suffering is plainly revealed under the light of Christ's transfigured glory. But that disfigurement of ours is transfigured in turn by the glory of the saving grace of Christ, healed by his compassion and transformed by his love into new life, into new humanity. Emmanuel, God with us, does not remain aloof and distant in the mountaintop, leaving us in our disfigured state of sin and suffering, but he descends from that glory to where we are, to suffer with us, to console and comfort us, and to redeem us. He pours out his love and compassion upon us that the disfigured humanity in us may be transfigured into his likeness. And he does so by assuming our disfigurement unto himself on the cross. Leo the Great, the church father in the 5th century, put put it this way. No degree of cruel inhumanity can destroy the religion founded upon the mystery of the cross of Christ. In all three Gospels, the transfiguration points back to the question Jesus asked his disciples six days before. Who do people say that I am? And as the story quickly moves onto the passion narrative, the transfiguration points forward to the hilltop of Golgotha and to the glory of his resurrection. Who do people say that I am? Jesus asked his disciples. And as we encounter his transfiguration once again today, we too are confronted with the same question. Who do you say Jesus is for you? What is your relationship like with Jesus? What does it mean for you that you are Jesus' disciple? Who is Jesus for you in your life?